Yema, everyone. It is a pleasure to meet you all beautiful seekers again. Just as you look forward to the Tuesday satsangs, I look forward to them too. And that is why no matter what, I will continue, continue them over the years, imparting these deep yoga teachings. So the logistics may change, but not the essence of the teaching. That will continue and in fact deepen with a more free-flowing platform, giving us many opportunities to teach you. So for the true mumokshus, that is a term along with tat that you should know. Mumokshu is connected to moksha, and moksha is a state of self-realization. It is a state of liberation, freedom from the limitations of the body, mind, intellect, the samsara. And it is a knowledge-enabled freedom. And a mamukshu is one who truly yearns for it, who truly wants it, who prioritizes it. This is not a casual encounter with the Vedic tradition, but a deep encounter with this decision that may this lifetime be my last story of being lost in samsara. Let me be found. And if there is another birth, it may be a short-lived one full of light. <laughs> and that's it. Done, done, done. And I have lots of freedom and lots of choice through this whole phenomena of birth, life and death. Right now, we are simply like puppets moving around. So Amamukshu is one who truly seeks the path of yoga. And bhakti yoga, especially when it is taught with a full-fledged Vedantic understanding, then it is not merely sentiment. It is truly a knowledge-enabled devotion and loving devotion towards the Supreme Reality, towards Ishvara, towards Paramatma, towards Brahman. Because And then to discover, lo and behold, that, that, that my true essence is one with that. Where was I trying to seek association here and there? But that is my true relative, my true friend, my true parent. And that is my deep, deep connection. And we have been exploring the rasas of bhakti. We have looked at das, dasya bhava or serving Ishwara with the joy of service, like the story of Shabri. We have looked at Sakha Bhava or participating in this devotional love of Ishwara because we see Ishwara as our buddy, our best friend. We have looked at Ishwara as our child. And we looked at the story of Maya Shoda and her tender scoldings of little Krishna. And so when, when Ishwara becomes our childlike deity, then we can scold it, <laughs> pamper it, and it's really beautiful. Today we are going to look at a romantic association with Ishwara. <laughs> yes, believe it or not, Ishwara can become your beloved and evoke within you uh, romantic feelings. But imagine what that must feel like. So let me explain it to you. Perhaps we all want to serve Ishwara. In fact, to become the holy servant, to become in service to Ishwara is a uniform expression of spiritual aspiration across faiths, across cultures. It marks the beginning of love and the reduction of ego because the ego doesn't want to serve. Then as bhakti deepens, it resembles the regard and love and affection one has for a friend. Yet more intimate, this love is of vatsalya bhava, the love of a parent 
towards a child. But a very intimate loving relationship is that of Madhurya Bhava, M-A-D-H-U-R-Y-A. Madhur means sweet. There are six tastes in Ayurveda. So sweet, sour, salty, bitter, astringent, pungent. And those of you who are Ayurveda students and practitioners here very well know the Madhur Rasa or the sweet taste. And this bhava or this emotion is known as the madhurya bhava or the madhur bhava. Uh, it, it is exemplified by the kind of love Mirabai had towards Krishna, where she thought of Krishna as her husband. And Radha, who was one of the milkmaids that little Krishna encountered growing up with his foster parents, in Vrindavan, and uh, um, when Krishna was growing up through his childhood, adolescence, teen and early youth, when he was still in that bucolic village, Krishna was adorned by all the women and men and children of the village. And all of them doted their affection upon him like doting mothers, like, like Yashoda, they were doting mothers. And even when they found reasons to complain about him or, um, or nag his mother about him, it was really just a way to engage with him, to always think of him, to frown at him, to be upset with him, to be want to be apologized by him. <laughs> they always wanted to connect with little Krishna. It was an irresistible affection for that child. In fact, there is a, and then as he grew into a teenager and then as a young youthful boy, he was handsome and beautiful and shining with an inner light beyond, beyond imagination. And there is a beautiful um, uh, hymn uh, to the sweetness of Krishna and it was composed by Sri Vallabhacharya, a beautiful bhakti saint. And I'll chant some of it to you just to understand the sweetness, the madhurya bhava, the sweetness that emerged from his persona. Adharam madhuram, vadanam madhuram, nayanam madhuram, hasitam madhuram, hidayam madhuram. Gamanam Madhuram Madhuradhipate Rakhilam Madhuram Vachanam Madhuram Charitam Madhuram Vasanam Madhuram Valitam Madhuram Chalitam Madhuram Brahmitam Madhuram Madhuradhipate Rakhilam Madhuram Perhaps I'll chant it for you in an audio file and share it with you if you like it. But I'll just translate the first two verses that I chanted from a total eight. And it goes, it goes like this. Sweet are his lips, his face so sweet because sweetness is madhurya. Sweet are his eyes, his smile so sweet. Sweet is his heart, his gait, his feet. Sweet Lord of sweetness, all is sweet. Sweet are his words, his deeds are sweet. Sweet are his garments, his curls are sweet. Sweet is his walk, sweet is his flight. Sweet Lord of sweetness, all is sweet. So it's just madhuram, 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 sweetness, sweetness, sweetness. It, it's just incomprehensible. Everything is sweet. And it goes on to say that his garlands are glowing with sweetness. Um, the lotus below his feet that keep popping up are sweet. Um, the sight of him brings about sweet freedom. 
hearing his flute, one becomes liberated with sweetness. Um, the cows that he heard are sweet. Sweet are the stick with which he herds them. His creation is sweet. Um, just and the one who's chanting becomes filled with madhuram bhava or the sweetness. And so when Krishna is often shown with a flute and the flute, he would play this and 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 the the gopis would the would drop whatever they are doing, washing their clothes, cooking their food, herding their cattle, and they would just go into a state of trance or just start walking towards him in search of him. So it's like when Ishwara plays the flute, we let go of our corporate jobs or our search for um, human people to fulfill us or some ambitions that must and the must-haves and the should-haves and the could-haves and we just get lost in that ethereal melody of the divine. And so his flute would um, pierce through the stillness of the night and resonate deep in the hearts of those who heard it. And many people didn't hear it, but the gopis would hear it. They were in a bhakti trance. And sometimes the women would walk towards him, these gopis, and they would start taking off their jewelry and their clothes would become come in a disarray. So they would stop their worship rituals and their cooking rituals, like I said, and just experience this longing to be with him. And they would... And they would rush so fast that their anklets would get caught up in, you know, the bushes and the and the wild grasses, and and their and their and their clothing would get stuck on hair on tree branches. They were in such haste that it was a sight to behold the manifestation of divine ecstasy, where earthly ties were forgotten. That's why when I say Madhurya Bhakti, it's really there's a there's a limitation of language. But sometimes it can induce tears, loss of control, um, ecstasy. And so it went from adoration when he was a child to a passionate, romantic, like a longing to be by youthful Krishna side. And, and these were not just girls. These were women. These were older women. These were men <laughs> just all around him. And, and so the reason it's called romantic is that the the only way to describe this longing is the kind of fire that takes over one. If you've ever been in, you know, in a crush or a infatuation or a human love, then you know what that feels like. Unless you see that person, unless you can can be next to that person, and if that's not possible, you need to think about that person constantly to to live. Otherwise. Everything else, eating, drinking, sleeping, everything falls to the side. That's what happens in peak moments of romance. And that is what happens to, uh, to, the, to the one who starts seeing, experiencing Krishna, uh, in this case, and Ishwara as a divine beloved. And so we see uh, a, a param gopi, like a chief gopi, her name was Radha. And it is said that she was many decades older than Krishna. Her age doesn't matter. The point is that it is said that Radha was an avatar of Lakshmi, the consort of Vishnu, and she um, she was she was a really symbolic of the Madhurya Bhava devotion that transcends. Societal norms, personal limitations, 
an unprecedented romantic bhakti where boundaries are blurred between the divinity and the devotee. It's, I, I must, I must applaud the Vedic Hindu tradition for allowing these different kinds of emotions. Then, whichever emotion, like in service, we feel fulfilled. In um, friendship, we can feel fulfilled. In mothering something, we feel fulfilled. Then in romance too, we feel fulfilled. And when we have romance with a conceptual understanding of Ishwara, then um, the fulfillment takes on a whole new sattvic dimension. It is a never-ending fulfillment. And if one has a spiritual intoxication to Ishwara, it's fine because in this crescendo of emotions, all the rajas and tamas ends. Now, we can't exactly... Uh, say, well, let's prescribe for you Madhurya Bhava. I don't experience Madhurya Bhava towards Ishwara. But, but Mirabai did, and I know of some people who do. I know them personally. And so we don't know which Bhava will work for you. But for some people, this is that Bhava. And so we have in Bhagavad Purana uh, this, this accommodation of all these bhavas. And there's a gopi, a milkmaid, who is singing, Oh, oh Krishna, uh, oh, oh my sweet one, oh my darling, my heart longs for you to behold your divine countenance as your eternal servant. Uh, I yearn for your presence. Please grace me with your sight of your radiant face. Because apparently when Krishna left Vrindavan, he left Gokul, he went off to Mathura and 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 went on to become a, you know, a teacher of the Bhagavad Gita. He these gopis were left languishing for him and their love and their and their poetry is um, part of the bhakti literature. So what we see here is that, if you remember the Sanskrit word for love, which is pure, it doesn't have ego, it doesn't have attachments, and it doesn't have an end point, it is known as prema. And prema stands on one side of the spectrum and all other emotions, anger, envy, hatred, competitiveness, jealousy, meanness, they all exist in the absence of this. When prema arises, everything else disappears. So I'm just going to read from some of my writing here. I've written, imagine the mind as an enchanted forest where the tiger of love roams freely. In the slush habitat, the nibbling parasites of unloving emotions find it difficult to thrive or even appear. So let these dark emotions be, but simultaneously cultivate, nurture, and practice divine love through bhakti yoga so that the tiger of love may grace the forest with its presence, eventually choosing to dwell there permanently. 